uh, for the first hour, I'm going to try to get through uh, mucokinetics and surfactants. And then for the second half of the class, I'm going to try. Nice. I'm going to try to do a review for midterm, if that sounds good for you guys. Yes. All right. Because I know some people kind of wanted to review, uh, do a little review of the math. Um, no, people are people are feeling pretty decent on math now. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, we'll go ahead and just review a few of the few of the basic concepts and. Uh, Hopefully our computer system will uh, reboot itself and begin working again. And we'll see here. So what the... Uh, you guys that did the reading, let's talk about, uh, while this thing's doing its thing, we'll just go ahead and start with the lecture. Let's talk about mucokinetics and surfactants. So we're going to start off with talking about mucokinetic agents. And um, those of you that read, hopefully everybody read, uh, does it actually talk about mucokinetics initially? Or does it kind of talk about a little bit of the physiology of something known as a mucociliary transport uh, mechanism? or sometimes it's called the mucociliary escalator. So explain that. Let's explain that. Tell me what is going on there. What do you guys think? The cilia is working to propel the mucus. OK. And it, it has like a beat to it. Good. And uh, this mucociliary uh, escalator, where does it exist? Is it throughout all of our airways? No, it's not. So basically from our upper, upper airway all the way down to approximately the, the terminal or the respiratory bronchial, do we have, uh, does this mucociliary escalator exist within the alveoli? No, we do not have that within the alveoli. So that's a, it's kind of an important determination to make there. All right, hey, what do you know? We got our computer up and running. All right. And I think you guys probably have already talked about this in, in your cardiac, uh, cardiorespiratory anatomy physiology a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, maybe. Okay, well, we'll talk about it now. You guys will hit it up again. And actually, we're going to talk about this on Wednesday when I do your guys' lab. Um, I actually spent uh, last week in the physiology lab um, making slides of um, heart and lung tissue and staining them and then taking pictures of those slides. Uh, and I'll have a nice little PowerPoint that I did for you guys, so we'll actually look at the real histology. And I'm sure you guys probably did that in anatomy and physiology already, but I thought, what the heck, uh, we just go ahead and revisit some of those. Uh, but here is a slice, obviously, this is a little picture of uh, at the airway. And I have the inner lumen of the airway here, mm -hmm. and then I have the adventitia or the connective tissue, the outer part of the airway here. Uh, so we have the air going in and out, and let's just go ahead and take a look at what we got here. We've got our mucus blanket, and how many layers are there in the mucus blanket? There are two layers. There's something called the gel and the sole layer. Um, the gel layer is very thin, and it's on the very surface. And what is the role of this gel layer here? <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. What is the role of the gel layer? Yeah. Protection. Protection. Okay. Well, the cilia is down here. It's on top. So actually, the, the gel layer is sticky, and it attracts things like uh, dust and uh, pollutants and things like that. It's tenacious. There, somebody said that. Yeah, tenacious. It's kind of sticky. So stuff sticks to it, and then the sole layer underneath it is 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 not quite as sticky. It moves a lot easier. And the little cilia beat um, up to about a thousand times a minute. So they're beating actually really quickly. They beat and they propel the sole layer and the sole layer moves. And then um, the gel layer is kind of dragged along with it. <clears throat> and uh, obviously, we are, where do we want this mucus to end up going? When it go to the upper airway and then we expectorate it, get rid of it. 
Okay, now we look at um, our first uh, layer of tissue called the mucosa. And this is actually where most of our lecture today will be concerned with the mucosa and a little bit of the submucosa. But, but really in the mucosal layer here, we have very specialized cells. And the, the primary cell, the lining of our airway, is known as a, a ciliated pseudostratified columnar uh, epithelial tissue. So you can see they look like kind of like little columns. And st what does stratified mean? They're stacked one on top of the other. These aren't, these aren't really stacked one on top of the other. Um, they, if, if you were to maybe look at them um, and plot them uh, horizontally, you could say that maybe they're stratified. Uh, so they call this pseudo-stratified. It's not exactly stratified. And obviously, they look like little columns. And then every so often, I have goblet cells. I have serous cells. And of course, the goblet cells and serous cells secrete of the substances that make up the mucus blanket or the mucus layer. And then I have in the submucosa layer, underneath the mucosal layer, I have my bronchial glands. This is also where the parasympathetic nervous system comes in and innervates these glands mm -hmm. and acts upon these glands and causes them to secrete. Uh, then I'll have a layer of cartilage. If I'm talking about the upper airway, say trachea or a main stem bronchi, will this layer be thick or thin? Thick. This will be very thick. This will be very thick in our cartilaginous airways. Um, and then I have connective tissue, adventitia, and then I'll obviously have a little bit of smooth muscle. Now, um, the smooth muscle becomes a little more significant in which types of airways? In the cartilaginous or the non-cartilaginous airways? No. The non, and of course, that is where we're concerned with bronchospasm. Okay, so that's just a basic anatomy physiology. And again, we're going to actually talk about this in a little more detail during lab. Um, Okay, so mucosa, inner layer, we talked about that a little bit, bronchial glands. We produce about 100 mils of mucus each day. Most is reabsorbed, uh, but about 10 milliliters per day reaches the pharynx. It's either swallowed or expectorated. Obviously, there are lots of conditions that can cause us to create more mucus. The mucociliary escalator or the mucociliary transport mechanism, there are lots of different names for this and we talked about what it is, it's actually not just one thing. You know, it involves the mucus, it involves the cells, it involves the movement of the mucus, the cilia, and so on and so forth. Obviously, this is very important for the pulmonary defense system because this is what gets debris, contamination, what have you, and traps it and hopefully sweeps it out of the lungs. Uh, they also, uh, the, the mucus itself contains lots of enzymes that help um, uh, with antimicrobial properties, help fight infection, obviously the cilia. And here we go, what, you know, when you know what the cilia are, and I'm glad I wasn't misquoting when I said a thousand times a minute, uh, they're about six microns in length, so really, really tiny. Um, each cell contains about 200 cilia, so we, we literally have billions of these little, little guys in our airway. Okay, so the mucosal blanket's only about five to 10 microns thick, so it's a very thin layer of mucus. Uh, obviously, we talked about what the gel layer and the sole layer is. And we know that the sole is a little watery and the gel is a little more tenacious. Okay, so mucus functions in the healthy uh, lung. And this, this little table here is actually right out of your book. So it prevents water from moving into and out of the epithelia. Is that a good thing? Sure, sure. We don't necessarily want water moving in to the epithelial tissue because it can swell and cause problems. And we also don't want excess amounts of water moving out or we can have dehydration. Do we still lose a significant amount of water from the act of breathing? What do you guys think? Absolutely, we still lose. And um, that is uh, what we call an insensible water loss. When you guys do your ICU rotations, you may hear the nurses talk about that, insensible water losses. And these are water losses that we can't really measure very accurately. And that would be things like sweating and breathing. OK, shielding the epithelia from direct contact with toxic materials, microorganisms, preventing infection uh, anti by, act by the action of antimicrobial enzymes, and obviously uh, lubrication. OK, mucus production. So we would all agree that uh, this mechanism needs to function properly. Would everyone agree? Okay, good. 
uh, volume, consistency, and structure of the mucus can be altered in different disease processes, and we'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, mucus clearing can be impaired, resulting in the accumulation of mucus in the lungs. Okay, nothing new there. All right, or cilia frequency is adversely affected. Does anybody here smoke? No smokers in here? That's, no that's great. Huh? Okay. <laughs> that's, that's great. It's, it's funny because I, I teach um, in the paramedic program, and over half of the, mm -hmm. those guys smoke. Every break, they're out there smoking, smoking, smoking. Um, anytime you have exposure to smoke, that will paralyze, that will stop the cilia. And you guys are probably familiar with something called the smoker's hack. Or smokers cough, where they get up in the morning and they hack and they cough and they have all this junk they can't get out. Well, that hopefully makes a little bit of sense. If my cilia are not working and they're not propelling the mucus out, uh, we're going to have more difficult time getting that mucus out. Um, some diseases, such as bronchiectasis, for example, um, increase, I'll have an increase in mucus production. Uh, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis um, are both two disorders where I have excessive amounts of mucus being produced, sometimes more mucus than I can clear effectively. Okay, so here is a really complicated picture of, of what, a, what the mucus structure uh, looks like. This is a little simplified, but what I have here is uh, mucus uh, is not just one molecule. I don't have mucus molecules uh, floating around there. Mucus is a really complicated structure made up of several different types of molecules. Um, it's, it's a protein, and you may see something called a mucoprotein strand, and this is just one little strand of the mucus. Um, so I have all these proteins here, and I even have DNA. Um, forming kind of a backbone structure down here of uh, the mucus. Uh, so I have these little muco, uh, these, these little proteins here, and these little proteins, of course, uh, if you guys remember uh, proteins from chemistry, how many types of structure can I have with a protein? Oh, yeah, I have about the four types, right? I can have my, my primary, and that, that is the, the amine bond um, of amino acids. And then I have my secondary structure, um, uh, where the it kind of folds over a little bit, and that's where I get these little things, the hydrogen bonds. And my tertiary structure, where I kind of fold into real special shapes, and that, that's where you get the beta pleated sheet and the alpha helix and all that. And I get all these other bonds. I have some physical bonds. I have disulfide bonds, or um, two sulfurs um, combined covalently. Uh, I also have some calcium bonding here, and even uh, DNA. Uh, down here as well. And different medications will break these different bonds at different places. So for example, mucomist or acetylcysteine works by breaking the disulfide bonds. However, if I give pulmazine, which is the other common uh, mucolytic that we run into, it will break down DNA. And those are the two uh, primary uh, mucolytics that we talk about in respiratory uh, are acetylcysteine or mucamus and uh, pulmazine. Now, um, I want you guys to make a little note on your notes here. There is another type of mucolytic that we use, and it is off-label. You guys remember what off-label means? It's not FDA-approved, FDA but you're going to see it and it is used extensively at MMC here in Crucis. So when you guys start doing clinical rotations through MMC, you will see this used. It is off-label, so you won't see it officially labeled to be used as a mucolytic, but it is still effective and it'll still work. And it is sodium bicarbonate. And those of you guys that um, maybe have some medical experience, you may be familiar with sodium bicarbonate, and we give it for um, some other issues. Um, I remember uh, last year when my paramedic students were rotating through ICU, I had them on a couple of the rotations, and we were giving nebulizers to intubated patients, and we got orders to give sodium bicarbonate, and they were very confused. They are like, why would I give sodium bicarbonate? What is going on here? And we actually had to educate them, no, this has mucolytic properties, and we're not giving it um, for the same reasons you're thinking. We're actually giving it because it does have mucolytic properties. It doesn't really talk about it in the book, however. Does it a little bit? Yeah. On page like maybe just a little, yeah. yeah. 
but it is used pretty extensively. So I do want you guys just to make a note of that. The two FDA approved mucolytics, however, the two approved mucolytics uh, that we use here in the United States uh, um, include acetylcysteine, mucamist, um, and pulmazine. And of course, mucamist is a brand, is a trade name, and it's the trade the trade name isn't actually produced in the United States anymore. So all the mucamist we run into is generic acetylcysteine, but people still call it mucamist, just because that's what we've always called it. So. Uh, those old habits are hard to break. Okay, so diseases that increase the volume or thickness of mucus. Uh, bron chronic bronchitis, asthma, cystic fibrosis, acute bronchitis, pneumonia. And I would like you guys to throw in bronchiectasis in, in this little table here because uh, bronchiectasis is associated with loss of mucus production as well. I know this table's out of the book, but if you could just add that in there because that is a major problem uh, with bronchiectasis and lots of mucus production. Okay, factors that impair ciliary activity. Okay, so we're not talking about the mucus production necessarily, we're talking about the cilia and impairing how they function. Endotracheal tubes. If I intubate a patient, I put a tube in a patient and breathe for them, I can paralyze or I can impair their, mucolary, uh, their mucociliary transport mechanism. Uh, that's really interesting. I never knew that uh, when I, before I got into respiratory therapy, but that the, the mere act of intubating somebody can do that. So what do you think a big goal is if I intubate a patient? What do you think the primary goal is? Keep it in there very long. Yeah, to get that tube out. And this was actually uh, a very hard habit for me to break because of my background in emergency medicine. I'm always, oh, let's innovate them, let's innovate them, let's innovate them, because that's the good thing to do. And then you start, you start realizing, oh my goodness, boy, I innovate somebody, but there's a whole laundry list of problems associated with that. And the primary goal of intubation is to get them extubated. And we're, we'll start talking about why that is, because so many problems can result from intubation. Extremes of temperature, have you guys ta started talking about heat and humidification at all? In, in, in lab or lecture, probably not till next semester. Um, there is specific temperatures and humidities that we need to have air at in our respiratory tract. And um, often when we innovate somebody and we bypass the normal heat and humidification mechanisms, because normally how is air heated and humidified in our respiratory tract? In the nose, right? We, the air goes into the nose, and I have what inside of my nose? Turbulence. There you go, your turbinates. And basically they increase the surface area and it allows that air to warm up and then the air gets warm, it gets heated, humidified, and it goes into the lower airways. Now if I put a tube in somebody's mouth and bypass that whole mechanism and then I'm, I'm delivering gas, is it gonna be cold or room temperature? Yeah. Is room temperature cold compared to what the body temperature is? It's frigid. What is what is room temperature? They say about um, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 so degrees Celsius. Uh, okay, so 20 degree, 20 so degrees Celsius. Body temperature is what? 37 Celsius. What Celsius? It's 37. Yeah, 37, 38 degrees Celsius. Huge difference. Would you guys agree? Huge difference there. Um, high concentrations of oxygen. Uh, this is another thing. Uh, back when I first got into medicine as an emergency medical technician, uh, we were taught give everybody oxygen and give them as much as you can possibly give. And now we're finding out that, well, well, if I give somebody lots of oxygen and I keep them on that, can I cause problems? You betcha. Lots of problems. And we'll talk about those later on. Dust, fumes, and smoke. Um, Anybody that's uh, lived overseas, uh, like I lived in Kabul for about a year, uh, some of the worst pollution I've ever been in, uh, I was coughing a lot, and I had a lot of issues uh, respiratory-wise. Dehydration, because what does that do to our mucus? It dries up, it becomes thick, it becomes more tenacious, harder to get out of, thick mucus, and infections. Okay, factors that lead to dehydration, increased respiratory rate, increased depth of breathing, Systemic fluid loss, if I become dehydrated, uh, maybe I'm urinating a lot of fluid, maybe have lots of diarrhea, maybe I have lost blood, uh, I've been involved in some sort of trauma. 
Um, infections, again, my temperature is going to be elevated. I'm going to be breathing rather rapidly and rather deep, and I'm going to lose. I'm going to have lots of insensible fluid loss. Okay, so how do we manage secretions? Well, there are three broad approaches to managing secretions. Um, those that increase the depth of the sole layer. And which layer is the sole layer? The second. Okay, so it's the second layer. So I increase the depth of the, the sole layer, and these include what we call our bland aerosols. Things like water, saline solutions, or sometimes expectorants. Okay, those that alter the consistency of the gel layer. So what layer are we talking about there? The gel layer, awesome. top layer. And those are our mucolytics. And then those that improve ciliary activity. And these can be things like bronchodilators and corticosteroids, which uh, we haven't talked about steroids yet in any um, amount of detail, but we will. We will get there. And we did talk about bronchodilators in quite a bit of detail, I, I think. Probably more detail than you guys care to hear. Okay, so secretion management approaches. Deep breathing, assisted coughing, suctioning. Have you guys talked a little bit about deep breathing, assisted coughing, um, CPT, chest percussive there? Okay, you will. Um, I'm not sure if you will this semester, but certainly next semester. Uh, you'll be doing that and things like IPPB. Um, so these will become more relevant at that time. But these are really good methods. Uh, what are some of the what are some of the, the first things that we do when we get patients out of surgery? I guess. In spirometry, right? Deep breathing. We actually start IS before surgery, right? We go in, and you guys will do this. You'll go in, hey, Mr. Jones, you're going to be having a cabbage today. Well, I'm going to go ahead and show you this incentive spirometer, and we're, what we're, this is going to do is this is going to keep your lungs opened up so you don't get infections and you can get out of the hospital sooner. You explain it to them. And what do you do? You have them use it, and you mark the best number that they can get to. And then you tell them, okay, after surgery, you are going to be using this several times an hour, and I want we want to get you back up to this number that you are here. And do we get them on incentive spirometry the day of their surgery? What do you guys think? Generally, yes. Generally, they will come out in the morning and have their cabbage. They'll come out in the morning. We'll have them excavated by the afternoon. They'll be sitting in a chair doing their incentive spirometry by the evening. How incredible is that? Uh, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, um, is that how, how it was? No, what would happen? They would stay intubated, and they would go to the ICU for a couple of days, spend a couple of days on the ventilator, and then we look at getting them extubated. Generally, we are extubating them. We're waking them up, extubating them the same day. And are we having better outcomes doing that? Mm -hmm. Yep. We're having better outcomes. The sooner we can get somebody home, the better they'll do, believe it or not. And I know a lot of people that don't know any better will say, oh, that's just because you want to save money. Well, yeah, it is because I want to save money. And it's saving money because you don't get an infection. You don't get atelectasis. You don't have mucus problems uh, if you go home soon. Um, every day that we keep people in the hospital, they have more and more problems, or a chance to have more and more problems. That's kind of non-intuitive, huh? Because a lot of us think, well, I go to the hospital to get better. Well, yeah, but the sooner we can get you out of the hospital, the better off you are. Uh, and certainly the germs that you are used to at home are going to be much better than all the germs that you're not used to in the hospital. And we know there are lots of nasty things that can get us in the hospital. Okay, mechanical techniques, that's the CPT, and then the drugs, that's what we'll talk about today. Okay, bland aerosols. So bland aerosols do not affect mucus molecule directly. They can dilute it out by altering its water content. Um, and these are referred to as wetting agents. These, however, can irritate the airway. The irritation produces, increases the production of thinner mucus. So yes, bland aerosol therapy can help, but it can hinder because it does irritate the airways. And can bland aerosols precipitate bronchospasms? Yes, so we need to be very careful about this. Uh, examples include water, normal saline, hypotonic, and hypertonic saline. Each of them have a little different use. OK, so delivery methods, humidification. You guys have all seen the nasal cannula. Somebody's been on a nasal cannula hospital, and it's hooked up to a little thing on the wall that's bubbling. You guys all seen that, or maybe a picture of it? 
If you haven't, you will. Don't worry, you will. You'll spend the first semester of clinicals doing nothing but floor care, and so you're going to run into this stuff quite a bit. Um, rehumidifying the air. Um, aerosols. Is there a difference between humidification and aerosol? What's the difference? What do you guys think the difference is? Okay. Well, what is an aerosol? An aerosol is a particle, right? It's a particle. And humidification is actually molecular. I'm actually putting molecular water into the air that they're breathing. Whereas an aerosol is a particle. It's not necessarily a molecule. And the aerosol rains out, right? We want it to rain out at a certain point so I can have deposition. That's not going to happen with humidified air. Okay, we can use small volume nebulizers, large volume, and ultrasonic. Have you guys talked about nebulizers at all in lab? No? Okay. You guys are familiar with the SVN. It's a little handheld. There's something called an LVN, a large volume nebulizer. The heart uh, is a common one used around here, and it's a larger container, and you should have a picture of it in your book. It's a larger container. Um, it's used for continuous therapy, therapy that's ongoing. Small volume nebulizer is generally one treatment and then you're done until it's time for the next treatment. And then there's something called an ultrasonic nebulizer. Have you guys ever heard of an ultrasonic nebulizer? Basically, what this does is this has a little crystal called a, 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 a piezoelectric crystal. And what we do is we put an electric potential across that crystal, and the crystal vibrates very rapidly back and forth. And the, the vibration of that crystal when we uh, put that in some sort of solution, say water, that the vibration of that will then aerosolize the water that it's in. It's very efficient. You can aerosolize a lot of water. But the problem with ultrasonic nebulizers is we can get a little too aggressive. And um, we can sometimes overload our patients with water. So we need to be very careful. And that's sometimes they like to ask that on tests about ultrasonic nebulization. Okay, uh -huh. direct installation, um, these instilling fluids directly into the respiratory tract. Do we like to do this? What do you guys think? Do we, would we really like doing this? No, this isn't something that we, we arbitrarily do. Uh, now, sometimes when you suction patients, you may have seen or you may have heard that they will, they will squirt or they'll distill fluid in before they suction. Again, that isn't something we should arbitrarily do. If we have to, we can, but we want to be very careful because can it irritate the airways? Yes. Can distilling fluid into the airways um, kind of push uh, pathogenic or contaminated material further into the lungs? It can, so we need to be very careful about how we do that. Uh, I talked about bronchoscopy uh, last week and um, uh, how we can instill, or maybe it was a couple weeks ago, and how we can directly instill fluids through a bronchoscope. And often what we'll do is we'll distill like mucomus, or sometimes if there's some bleeding in, in, in the airways, we can distill some epinephrine in there to stop the bleeding. That's actually a test question. I had that on one of my tests where they were doing a bronchoscopy, there was some bleeding in the lungs, what medication could you use? Well, what do you guys think? Could you use epinephrine? Sure, because what's epinephrine going to do? What receptor? Alpha, alpha. alpha 1 receptors, yeah. Yeah, so there we go. Pharmacology in action there. Uh, <laughs> however, this is very irritating, can cause a strong cough, and do you think it can cause or precipitate bronchospasm? Yes. Okay, some examples. Sterile water It's good. It's free of microorganisms. There are some additives that make it bacteriostatic. Uh, often we use it as a dilutant for other aerosolized medications. Um, more commonly, we'll use this with a cool mist setup. Like somebody who maybe has croup. You guys are familiar with croup in kids? It's a viral um, infection of the subglottic airway. And it causes the whole strider and the barking cough and all that that we're used to. Uh, and something called the uh, steeple sign when you guys start looking at x-rays in a semester or two. Okay. Uh, and sometimes uh, cool mist tent. Have you guys gone over that, the tent back there yet? Okay, you will in lab um, setting up the, t uh, the tent. 
Uh, water is hypotonic, so which way is the fluid going to shift? The water going to shift? It's hypotonic. In or out of the cells? Where is it going to want to go? It's going to want to go in, right? Yes. Hypotonic uh, solutions are going to want to shift into the cells. And can I have overhydration of cells occurring or, or edema occur? Yes, I can. So you need to be very careful about uh, giving these, well, all of these, obviously. Uh, distilled water, sterile, pure, no additives or minerals. It's more irritating, however, than sterile water. You don't really give a whole lot of distilled water. Um, I've never given it. Okay, normal saline. Normal saline is physiologically normal. What do I mean by that, normal? Body? Yes, it's isotonic. Which means, which way is water want to shift in an isotonic solution? Right. It, there's an equal amount of water shifting in to the cell as there is shifting out of the cell. Okay. Hypotonic, of course, is shifting into the cell. And what do you suppose, what do you suppose hypertonic would do? Pull water out of the cells. Okay. Yes. We had a test question in our lab about that distilled, and uh -huh. um, it was in our Egan's book. It says sterilized distilled. Mm -hmm. And in the system, it says you don't use distilled. I would use them separately. Yeah. Distilled. Yeah. It talks about them separately. You're not really going to use distilled. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I didn't see the lab question. I'm not going to be asking you distilled water questions on any of your tests. Um, I, don't, I don't know, that's probably not a satisfactory answer, but I don't know what, you know, you'd have to ask them what their rationale is in lab, but. I think it's um, a CTAP, but a unit of Oh, yeah, he's, yeah, we will normally use sterile, sterile water. Is, what you use. Is, it, is, it, is it technically distilled? Yeah, I mean, we do distill it, but we still add, we still have additives to make it bacteriostatic, and that's why we call it sterile water, because it does have additives in it, it's pH adjusted. Um, things like that. That is what you will always use for the, for the most part, will be the, the sterile water. Uh, even for ventilators, for heat and humidification, that's what you'll use. Okay, um, normal saline is used to dilute aerosolized medications as well. So often when we give albuterol, for example, and let's say I'm giving the 0.5% albuterol, and I pull out half a milliliter and put that in my small volume nebulizer, do you think that half a milliliter is going to get effectively nebulized? No, it's not. So often what I'll do, if I'm using 0.5% albuterol, is I'll pull the 0.5% albuterol out, half a milliliter, we'll say, 2.5 milligrams, we'll put it in there, and then we'll dilute it with 3 milliliters of normal saline. So that small volume nebulizer will deliver that effectively. And that's commonly what you'll see. Now, if I'm using the 0.083% albuterol, it's already diluted in three milliliters. So that's the beauty of the, the prepackaged medications. In clinicals, you may find yourself <coughs> using 0.5% and diluting it, or you may find yourself using the unit dose. It just kind of depends. But no, if you're using the 0.5%, you will need to add sterile saline and dilute that. Hypertonic saline, any solution, it contains more than 0.9%. Uh, the commonly used uh, solutions are 5 and 10%. So these are very hypertonic. Um, they pull fluid out of cells. And this is commonly used for sputum induction. And if we want somebody to cough and get some sputum up, maybe we want a sample of that sputum, send it to the lab, uh, culture it. Uh, we will give them a hypertonic saline treatment. However, do you think that this is irritating to the point of causing bronchospasm? Yes, it can be. So we need to be very judicious and very careful about how we use hypertonic saline. But just know that sometimes they will give it to uh, do a sputum induction so we can get a sample. Okay, hypotonic, we talked a little bit about that. It's less irritating. Um, ultrasonic nebulizers or any large volume nebulizer, uh, often we, we can give this to help hydrate uh, and thin out mucus. And this is just a common concentration that I talked about, little table in your book. Okay, finally, finally, we're on to the drugs. So we got through all that stuff. We're on to the drugs. Mucolytics. So there are drugs that control mucus by their action of altering the structure of the mucus molecule. 
So when we give mucolytics, we're going to be talking about altering the structure of the mucus molecule itself. Facilitates the expectoration uh, uh, of mucus by liquefying it, or it helps break down complex molecular strands to thin, in essence, thin out mucus. There are two agents that are approved, mucomist or acetylcysteine, and then pulmazine. Is there another name for pulmazine? Is there another name for this? Pulmazine? We'll find out. All right. So, mucomist. Uh, acetylcysteine is a generic name. Used to treat thick, viscous secretions. It's used in disease such as CF, chronic fibro uh, fibrosis, chronic bronchitis, TB, acute tracheobronchitis. Um, and I would like you to just add in bronchiectasis. Sometimes we can use that bronchiectasis as well. So it works by disrupting disulfide bonds in mucus. And you guys remember that picture I showed you earlier where the top layer of mucus had the hydrogen bonding and then kind of the intermediate layers where I had my disulfide bonds. Uh, releases uh, mucopolysaccharide strands. Okay, again, you don't have to memorize that. Just know that the strands are held together in that intermediate area of the mucoprotein molecule or strand by disulfide bonds. You break the disulfide bonds and that disrupts the structure <coughs> of the mucoprotein. Uh, causes an odor due to the release of hydrogen sulfide. Has anyone ever <laughs> um, smelled mucomus or acetylcysteine? Rotten eggs. Rotten eggs, yes. It has a nasty smell to it. Um, they say it's tasteless. I don't know about that. Um, I've given a lot of it as an ER nurse because people that overdose on Tylenol, uh, mucomus is actually a very strong antioxidant, and this is the antidote for Tylenol overdose. And when I first got into nursing, we'd have to make our patients drink it. And I'm talking grams of mucomus. And they didn't seem to think that it tasted very good at all. <laughs> we often had to dilute it in soda and things like that. Uh, because it, they said it tasted so poorly. I don't know. Uh, I don't have any personal experience, but uh, I, there's some empirical experience that says I don't know about the whole tasteless thing. It does have a pretty strong odor, however. How do we <laughs> administer it? 10% sol uh, solution, 6 to 10 milliliters TID or QID, three times or four times a day. So um, how many milligrams would that be? Well, 10% equals what? 10% equals 100 milligrams per milliliter. Okay, so 6 to 10 milliliters would be what? 600 to 1,000. Good. Okay, 20%. 200 milligrams per milliliter. It says 3 to 5 milliliters TID. Well, is that the same dose? Yes. Yeah, it's the same dose. Yeah, it's good. All right. Adverse reactions, bronchospasm. And remember I blue light special this um, a few lectures ago and said, what do we always give if we give a mucolytic? Like bronchodilator. Bronchodilator. You need to give a bronchodilator, and that is still true. Uh, can cause nausea, go figure. <laughs> uh, rhinorrhea, runny nose, bronchorrhea, excessive thin watery secretions. You can have stomatitis or inflammation of the mucus lining in the mouth. Uh, the big thing that we need to worry about and we need to monitor for is bronchospasm. And obviously, uh, we need to make sure that they have a bronchodilator order uh, with this. Okay, so here's just a picture. I have my disulfide bond here. Here, it, um, These are actually two molecules of acetylcysteine here. And you can see the little hydrogen here. Right there. You can see the hydrogen. So the hydrogen attaches to the sulfur. And once the hydrogen is bound to the sulfur, do the sulfurs want to bind anymore? Well, no, because it, the octet has been met for each sulfur and each hydrogen. The octet rule has been met. They're happy, uh, quote unquote. And so the sulfur bond is then broken, and you can see that the mucoprotein then becomes disrupted, breaks apart. Okay, other uses, and I talked about this as an antidote for a Tylenol or acetaminophen overdose. Uh, there we go. So here is interesting. Something else to cover the taste. Mm. 
tasteless. Mm. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, can be given by a nasal gastric. What is a nasal gastric tube? Yeah, an NG tube. It's a tube that we insert in the nose, and then it goes into the stomach. All right. Uh, Dornase alpha. That was the name I was looking for. Dornase alpha is the other name for pulmazine. Okay. What it is, is it's a clone, it's a copy of natural human enzyme that digests or helps break down DNA. Um, it's a solution of recombinant human DNA or deoxyribonuclease, nuclease. <coughs> and of course, you know, if it has an ASE at the end of it, you can almost always assume, oh, that's an enzyme, <laughs> uh, DNAase. So it's basically a copy of the enzyme DNAase. It's used to manage viscous pulmonary secretions seen in cystic fibrosis. So Dornase alpha or pulmazine is a pretty specific to patients that have cystic fibrosis. We don't really see it used for other types of patients. That's generally, um, generally other types of patients are going to be getting uh, the, the mucomus. And of course, uh, because the, muca, the mucus in cystic fibrosis patients is a little different, in the way that it's formed and its, its structure and function. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail because you guys will talk about cystic fibrosis and pathology, your pathophysiology class, um, and the way that they make mucus and the way that they transport ions, like chloride, is very different than normal people. In fact, that's the test. Boy, that's a test question, too. The uh, test that we use, does anyone know what test we use to detect cystic fibrosis? We look at the sweat, and we'll do what's called a sweat chloride test, the skin chloride test. And that's one of those specialty tests that they'll talk about for um, diagnosing cystic fibrosis. Okay, doses administration, single dose ampules, it's usually administered once daily, should not be diluted or mixed with anything else. We need to refrigerate it and protect it from life. So it's kind of a high maintenance drug, would you guys agree? Kind of a high maintenance drug. Um, Okay, adverse reactions, generally safe and well tolerated. Uh, these are real <clears throat> minimal side effects, chest pain, conjunctivitis, rash, laryngitis, pharyngitis, altered voice, not particularly common. Okay, expectorants. So expectorants increase the production and expectoration of mucus by increasing the amount of fluid in the respiratory tract. Um, these are the main ingredients in a lot of the over-the-counter cough and cold medications can work by increasing the vagal gastric reflex stimulation or absorption into the respiratory glands. Ultimately, it stimulates mucus production. Uh, some examples, glyphenicin is the big one that we run into here in the United States. What do we often see patients getting, though, in the United States, over-the-counter wise? <clears throat> what do they add to glyphenicin? Over the counter. You often see this mixed with a medication called dexamethorphan, I believe, which uh, is a cough suppressant. So let's let's do some math here. Expectorant helps us cough, helps us get stuff out, right? Cough suppression. What does a cough suppressant do? Does anybody see a problem? Here? Okay. So over-the-counter medications, <clears throat> rather interesting. I'm giving glyphenicin an expectorant and then dex dexamethorphan a cough suppressant. Hmm, that's some interesting logic at play there. Would you guys agree? <laughs> some interesting logic going on there. Okay. Uh, Antitussives and cough, there we go, dexamethorphan, a non-narcotic. Should never be given to patients with thick retained secretions. Uh, codeine, uh, somebody had mentioned giving a narcotic. Uh, codeine is the most common narcotic cough suppressant. Other narcotics can suppress cough, though, um, not just codeine. Uh, okay, depress the cough center. Now, why you would want to give a cough suppressant to somebody that you want to cough? Because right? it's coughing a good thing, generally. Yes. Is it necessarily comfortable? No, but it's a good thing. So if you're sick and you're coughing, uh, why would you want to suppress that cough? That cough is a sign that you need to get stuff out, right? Because when you get sick, you get a cold, you get the flu, you have massive death, right? You have millions and millions and millions of cells dying, 
and and viruses shedding and all that. And where's all that junk go? Well, it just falls off in your lungs, and you want to get that. You want to cough all that out. Okie dokie. Uh, ethanol, ethyl alcohol. We used to use this, believe it or not. And you don't really seem to use as much anymore. <coughs> but ethanol, yes, it's ethanol, like the ethanol that we're all, we all know. And um, it's a surface active agent that can decrease surface tension of the secretions. Historically, we used to use it to uh, treat pulmonary edema. So somebody would have congestive heart failure, they'd have fluid back up in their lungs, they'd have pulmonary edema. It was not uncommon to see them receiving aerosolized ethanol. However, it's very irritating and can be harmful to pulmonary tissue. And we have much better ways of dealing with pulmonary edema today. We have things like nitroglycerin. We have things like um, angiotensin converting uh, in, uh, inhibitors, enzyme inhibitors, and we have CPAP. Uh, so very effective strategies. Uh, you still occasionally see this talked about, uh, but it's not really in practice, at least in the United States. Okay, uh, physiology and surfactant synthesis. Okay. So let's go ahead and just talk about surfactant. There are three primary cells I have in my lungs. Would you guys agree? Three primary cells in the alveoli, I should, I should, uh, I should say. Not necessarily in the lungs, but in the alveoli. Let's see if I can. And I'm just going to go ahead and draw this out and give you guys a break from the PowerPoints. How does that sound? All right. You guys have the PowerPoints in your, your notes anyway. So let's go ahead and power this off and talk about the alveoli. All right. So I'll do my best here to draw an alveoli. Okay. So uh, what, are the types, what are the three types of cells I have in the alveoli? Okay, so I have my type 1 cells, and I'll kind of draw those. Again, I'm not exactly Rembrandt, so just bear with me. Okay, so type 1 cells, would you guys agree? Type 1 cells, and these are type 1 pulmonary pneumocytes. Okay, what are they? What are they? What's their job? What's the job of a type 1 cell? <clears throat> yeah, it, 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 it is the basement membrane, right? It is the actual structure of the alveoli. It's the basement membrane, and a gas diffusion will occur through those as well. Okay, what other types of cells do I have? Okay, so I have my type 2 cells. My type 2. And what do my type 2 cells do? Surfactant. surfactant. They secrete surfactant. And what is the other type of cell that we have? There we go. We have a macrophage. So we also have macrophage. What is a macrophage? What is it, though? What is a macrophage? <coughs> it's a white blood cell? What are the five types of white blood cells that we have? You guys remember uh, never let monkeys eat bananas? Anyone ever heard of that? So, never let monkeys eat bananas. So I have neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils. Somebody said that a macrophage is a white blood cell. I don't see macrophage on this list. Ah, you got it. When, you know, I've never seen a movie called Osmosis Joe, Joe is it? It's it kind of like a cartoon with Bill Murray, and he, he gets an infection. And um, was it Eddie Murphy, or I don't, I don't know, whoever plays a voice for it. Well, anyway, he's a white blood cell, and he has this really super thing where he can move in and out of different cells and in and out of the bloodstream. And when a monocyte leaves a bloodstream and goes out into the tissue, it becomes a macrophage. So that's actually where the, this is actually a monocyte. Okay, and you guys are right. It, 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 it engulfs debris and uh, gets rid of garbage, basically. They're little garbage trucks. And, 
Okay, so surfactant. What does surfactant do? Why, why do we want reduced surface tension? Okay, good. So, and we're not actually going to talk about it in depth in this class, but there's something called uh, the law of Laplace. Anyone here really good at, in physics? Taking some physics? Ever heard of the law of Laplace? Not like the Laplace operator, <clears throat> if you're thinking about um, gradients and the Schrodinger equation and all that. It's, it's not a gradient, but the law of Laplace in biology refers to um, distending pressure of a bubble. And we'll talk about this in physics next semester and how we can model the alveoli and say that they're basically little bubbles. And you have a liquid air interface. <clears throat> and the pressure that it takes to distend or keep a bubble open is related to how big it is. And some really, really um, non-intuitive, or the radius, there are really some non-intuitive concepts that come into play. But, be that as it may, surfactant does decrease surface tension, and it allows the alveoli to open up easier or harder? Easier. easier. It makes the alveoli easier to open up. And it prevents the alveoli from doing what? Collapsing. It prevents them from collapsing when we exhale. Why is it such a bad thing to have alveoli collapse? Because it's your respiratory exchange. Or your okay, so I can get I can get a little um, what we call shunting, right? Mm -hmm. But what what else? What else along with that? And this actually goes into that Laplace's law. When is a balloon the most difficult to inflate? When it's totally flat or when we've already inflated it a little bit? When it's totally flat, would you guys agree that, and you've seen you take those little balloons out of the package and you're stretching them and you're blowing in there and nothing's happening, you're like, ah, stupid birthday parties, right? Everyone's kind of had that, that may, hopefully you've had that experience, you're trying to blow up a balloon, you're like, ah, and then once you get it blown up a little bit, it blows up and then you're like, and it blows up really easily after that. You're like, what the heck's going on? That is the law of Laplace. When something is collapsed, and very small and collapsed, the pressure it takes to distend or open that is going to be a lot higher than if it was already distended somewhat to begin with. So, am I going to have to work my work of breathing? Is it going to be a lot higher if I have all these little collapsed alveoli in my body? Absolutely. So I'm going to have some shunting, and I'm going to have increased work of breathing to open those collapsed alveoli up every time. So what, what do we make? We make surfactant, and that prevents the decrease of surface tension and prevents the alveoli from collapsing. And what else does it do? And this is really non-intuitive. What else does it do? Does it help prevent over-distension <clears throat> of the alveoli? How? So let's, let's draw a picture here. Here's an alveoli. And I'm going to go ahead and just draw a layer, of surf, uh, a layer of fluid in here. And then I'm going to draw some surfactant molecules. It'll be the little green things here. Okay. So would you guys agree that these surfactant molecules are relatively close to one another? They're relatively concentrated? So my surface tension is low right here. Would you guys agree? So now I'm going to start inhaling. And then my alveoli are going to get really distended, and I'm going to have, well, I'm going to have the herring brewer reflex, right? I'm going to feel the stretching. But what else is going to happen as this becomes really <laughs> distended? What will happen to the surfactant? Let me draw that surfactant, the surfactant again. It gets spread out. Would you guys agree? It gets spread out. And what happens as it spreads out? The surface tension is going to increase. So this surfactant is a mechanism, is one of the mechanisms that prevents over distension as well, because as my alveoli fill up, the surfactant decreases, it thins out in essence, and the surface tension increases, and it makes it harder to, to continue distending that alveoli. So it's kind of a mechanism. And there are several. Not only is there this, but there's a herring brewer mechanism and so on. Um, but what we're worried about is this here. 
keeping the alveoli open when we exhale. When I exhale, there's still a certain amount of air left in my lungs, right? There's a residual volume, and there is the expiratory uh, reserve uh, volume. Okay. So if we understand that, then we kind of understand why we need surfactant. Who do you think has problems producing surfactant? Babies. Babies, why? Preterm. Preterm babies specifically, why? What's that? <clears throat> what is the, what is basically, what is the last organ system to develop? The lungs, why? Oh, no. so, yeah, you're, you're close. Okay. Why? There we go. You don't need your lungs when you're in utero. You don't need them. Because where are you getting all your oxygen, your, all your, your gas exchange? You've got a big old placenta as your lung. And that's obviously attached to the inside of the uterus. So if I have a placenta that's doing all my gas exchange for me and a little umbilical cord that's put it right in and out of my body. Do I need to care about breathing? Nope. So the last few weeks of fetal development is where I have my lung maturity, where my lungs become fully mature because the baby needs to get ready to transition for life outside of the uterus. And obviously there are lots of different things that go into that, but the last things to really develop are the lungs. So if I have a premature baby, can they not be producing surfactant? Absolutely. Can that lead to problems with the baby? Yes, absolutely. It can lead to lots of different problems. So, what do you think we can do? Make up for the surfactant. We can give them surfactant, actually. We can give them surfactant. We actually can. Ma we actually manufacture surfactant. Uh, there are synthetic types, and then there are natural types. The synthetic, of course, are, are synthetically made uh, exclusively in a lab, recombinant DNA uh, technology, things like that. And in the natural surfactant, uh, we usually will get from the lungs of different animals. So each type of surfactant has its pros and cons. Uh, some examples of surfactant. Uh, Cervanta is one type. And you guys should have a little list um, in your book of the different types of surfactant. Cervanta is one, very common. Um, inf infrasurf is another. Uh, InfraSurf is what's known as a natural surfactant. And this is actually in your slides as well, in your notes. Um, so natural surfactant is produced by what? Animal. Animals. There you go. If I say it's a natural surfactant, it's, it's produced by animals. Synthetic, of course, is not. The doses, guys, I don't want you to memorize the doses because each type of surfactant is a little different in how we, uh, how we dose it and administer it. But what I do want you guys to know is generally how we administer it. So does a baby have two lungs? Well, generally, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so do we need to get surfactant into both lungs? Yeah, so generally what we're going to do is we will calculate the dose that we need to give, and then we'll divide that into two separate equal doses. The baby will be intubated. It'll be a tube in. We'll put the baby on one side, give them a surfactant, allow it to go down into one lung for a little while, and then what do you think we'll do? Turn the baby over to the other side, give the other dose. That's generally how we'll give surfactant. Um, or that's generally how they recommend it given. Okay. Um, Kurosurf is another type of surfactant. Uh, it's another, it's a natural, uh, <coughs> little modified, I believe it comes from pigs, pig lungs. Kind of an interesting thought. Um, okay. And I will put you guys on break. When we come back from break, I'm going to show you, a, I have a really cool video of giving surfactant to a baby I'm going to show you, and then we will, uh, but that's actually it for this chapter, so pretty short and sweet, but that gives us a little bit of time to just review any concepts that you guys are um, a, little anxious, a little not sure on, and uh, that'll lead us into um, midterms next week. Okay, guys.